Hello, welcome. Sit down, grab a mug of tea. Today, we are going to talk about your sleeping issues. Why haven't you been able to sleep lately, huh? It's ironic that I am filming this while being somewhat sleep deprived as I have not been able to sleep for the last two nights, but I really think that speaks to my credibility when it comes to me saying that I am really terrible at sleeping. And my terribleness at sleeping is something I've put a lot of thought towards and is something that I've been working a lot on to improve. Um, clearly, <laughs> that is still a work in progress, and I think it will continue to be for a really long time. But I think this is a particularly relevant thing to discuss for a number of reasons. First of all, because we live in a society, yes. But also, that society is really structured towards early, er, early birds or morning people whatever the opposite of night owls is. We live in a society that idolizes people who wake up early at 5 a.m. and go for a run and get into the office by 7 a.m. and who sees people who wake up later in the morning as being lazy and undisciplined, even though being an early bird or a night owl is a genetic thing, but society doesn't really account for that. Plus, we live in a society that idolizes hustle culture and working yourself to the bone and bragging about how little you sleep. The idolization of hustle culture and the pressure for all of us to perform, amongst all these other things, has impacted the ability for a lot of us to obtain healthy sleep. It almost feels sometimes like if you're somebody who is getting enough healthy sleep, you're like not working hard enough or you're lazy, which is absurd and insane. So I think this is a particularly relevant thing to talk about, especially after these last couple years where so many of us have had kind of a spiritual awakening or who have kind of taken a step back from these busy, hustling lives that we've led and now have a renewed desire to learn how to take care of ourselves again and learn to nourish our bodies and our souls. And a huge part of that is knowing how to sleep, knowing how to lay down and not let all of your crushing, stressful, existential thoughts keep you laying awake until like 3 a.m. Like that's ever happened to me. So if you are somebody who is has always wanted to know what a good, healthy night of sleep feels like, you're not super certain on how to obtain that or you're curious to learn more strategies for how you can approach getting a nice, healthy, full night of sleep, um, you're in the right place. So like I said, this is something I have spent a lot of time cultivating and just trying to learn for myself and my own body how the hell to actually sleep and how to get that full eight hours that I need. And if you're coming here being one of those people that's like, nah, I only need six or seven hours to function, like, yeah, I was one of those people too. But the fact is that the vast, vast majority of the population does need eight hours, and while you can technically function with less than eight hours, you are most likely doing your body a disservice by not giving it that extra hour of sleep. And there are a number of long-term health impacts from even just like a little bit of consistent sleep deprivation over many, many years. So the very first thing that I started doing for myself when I was looking to improve my sleep was to watch my caffeine intake. And I was definitely one of those college kids and early adult life people that was downing like anywhere from two to four cups of coffee a day, um, especially when I was really busy and not sleeping a lot. Uh, those are times. I was also one of those people that was like, yeah, I'll have a whole cup of cold brew coffee and just fall asleep on the couch and nap. Caffeine puts me to sleep. Mind you, caffeine is going to have a different impact on everybody's bodies, but I basically just took some time to learn a little bit more about my body's reaction to caffeine and just what caffeine does <laughs> to your system. And yeah, I could drink a cup of coffee and then go to sleep and then wake up and go about my day, but the 
caffeine would basically just take time to absorb into my system and would be kicking in as I came out of that nap and then all of the things that it does to force yourself to stay awake would kick in after that and then I would have trouble falling asleep later, many many hours later because the half-life of caffeine in your body for the average adult, typically the average adult in historical medical sciences is like a 150 pound white male, but using that as our baseline, most of the rest of our health recommendations are on that baseline. So, you know, take this and move this around depending on what type of individual you are. But the average half-life for caffeine in a healthy human body is five hours half-life. So that means that if you have drink a cup of coffee with 100 milligrams of caffeine, five hours later you will have 50 milligrams of caffeine left in your system and five hours later 25 milligrams of caffeine left in your system. Um, so it takes a really long time for caffeine to actually fully get out of your system and for your body to stop feeling the impacts of caffeine. So the first thing that I started doing was I would stop drinking coffee after lunch. And what I would start to do instead is after, and I would have lunch around noon with my schedule. So after noon, I would switch to green tea. If I was having a bad day, I might do black tea, but I would normally just switch to tea. After some time, I got rid of even the tea after lunch and I started just drinking water. And in the mornings, I would still have maybe up to two cups of coffee, but no more than that, knowing that an eight ounce cup of coffee will have, I, I think it's typically 90 to 110 milligrams of caffeine, which for a 115 pound person of my size is plenty. <laughs> um, so. Over time, I was able to just have my one cup of coffee to start the morning and then just switch to water for the rest of the day after that. And speaking of water, remember to stay hydrated, friends. This looks like tea, but it's actually um, water with an old tea bag that I'm hoping to seep some flavors out of. I don't know if I'm the only one that does that, I don't know if that's weird, but the tea was delicious, so I mean. This is how I would strategize with my caffeine intake. And that has definitely had a big impact on my ability to fall asleep, which is the thing that's most difficult for me. I will definitely notice if I've had caffeine too late in the day because as I'm closing my eyes, trying to fall asleep, my heart feels like it's, it's just like, it's just going like, hey, your brain is tired, your body's trying to go to sleep, but like, we got shit to do. And that is really distracting for my focus on the, the sleep thing that I'm trying to do. This also means that I will not have desserts that have matcha tea in them, like around dinner time, and I've definitely seen a lot of like matcha tea uh, cheesecakes and things and really wanted them, but most of the time I will buy it and then bring it home to have like the, the next day matcha tea cheesecake for breakfast. Sounds great to me. So. That's enough about caffeine. We've got a lot more tips to go through here. Exercise is the next thing that I found helped me. I think in terms of studies that have been done about this, exercise doesn't have a huge impact on people's abilities to sleep. But I know for me, in terms of feeling tired enough to fall asleep, if I'm exercising regularly, it just comes way easier to me. Mind you, I am somebody that tends to exercise first thing in the morning, so if you are somebody that does exercise in the evening, the typical recommendation is don't do it between two, two to three hours before bedtime is the, the closest that you can cut it, just because of the amount of time your body will take to wind down after that and start entering the natural sleep state that it goes into. I am somebody who has worked a desk job for many years, I'm somebody who is now working from home, so I don't naturally get a lot of exercise as part of my day to day so making sure that I have and I know the typical recommendation is 30 minutes a day there was a period of time where I was doing more of that where I had access to really nice gyms and things when I was in school and had access to the university gym I was definitely able to put in more than that now living outside of a university campus I have not always had that nice access to a gym at least taking a minimum of 10 minutes in the morning if I don't have the energy to do anything super strenuous that day at least doing 10 minutes of stretching or of light yoga, just doing something to move my body is 
really, really helpful. Definitely more strenuous, longer exercise will have more of an impact on how tired I'll be at the end of the day, but at least making that time to actually move my body instead of just being completely lethargic all day has a really big impact for my ability to relax come evening. The other thing that I've noticed more recently is eating before bed, and I'm definitely somebody who had a habit growing up. Like, you know, I would have my dinner, I would chill out, hang out with the family for a little bit, have a nice big bowl of ice cream or two or some chocolate or something like that, uh, and then go to bed. As somebody now becoming sensitive to the things that impact my ability to fall asleep, eating before bed is a balance. As an adult responsible for feeding myself, I have sometimes had dinner between 9 and 10 p.m. and then tried to go to bed at 11 after having like a really big meal because I waited so late to have my dinner that I was really hungry and I got a lot of food and I just stuffed myself. Cannot sleep when I do that. Like, like my, my body, I guess, is just still digesting, it's still doing, it's still got stuff to do and it's like, hey, we can't be sleeping right now. On the flip side, going to bed hungry is another thing that will definitely keep you awake. It's another thing that keeps me awake. Laying there trying to sleep and your stomach's like, Bro, I am empty, like we're running on no gas and it, it doesn't seem like you should need food to sleep, but you know, your, your body, your brain, it's, it's busy while you're asleep, it's doing a lot, it's gotta heal all the damage that you did during the day. So going to sleep hungry is, is also something that's not gonna be super beneficial to falling asleep easily and staying asleep. So it's definitely a balancing act. I now try to make sure that um, if I'm going to bed at like 10 or 11 that I try to eat dinner by like 7 or 7.30. And then if I do start to get hungry close to bedtime, I will try to have a small snack. In terms of what to eat right before bed, I've, I've heard so many mixed things. Some people are like, if you eat carbs before bed, you know, carbs are an energy source for your body and it's gonna keep you awake all night. And some people are like, well, if I eat protein before bed, that just takes so long for my body to digest and I just can't sleep. I think this is just something you're gonna have to figure out for your own unique body composition, your own unique microbiome, what works for you. But I've generally found it's kind of a balance in terms of just making sure that you have enough calories. Oh, and if you are grabbing snacks before bed, one thing that I learned really recently is that chocolate actually has caffeine. It's not that much if you're just having like a couple little bites of chocolate, a couple little like Dove candies. I, I am sort of suspecting that part of the reason I was unable to fall asleep last night is because I had a big cup of really rich, delicious, beautiful hot cocoa. As I was falling asleep, that thing that I explained that I noticed when I've had caffeine too close to bed, I felt like that was happening to me. I, I was so tired and I closed my eyes to let sleep come to me and my heart was like, we're, we're doing stuff, we're, we're busy. And I was like, all I had was a latte at 9 a.m no other caffeine and then today i was like hot chocolate at 6 p.m i don't know it may not have been the hot cocoa's fault it was delicious and and probably worth it immense amounts of cocoa is something to look out for if you're grabbing chocolate close to bedtime there is going to be some caffeine in that if you are someone who is very sensitive to caffeine good thing to keep track of oh yes and then there is drinking before bed and i mean that in several different ways of drinking. I'm somebody who loves to have a cup of chamomile tea or valerian root tea or lavender tea, just something calming and soothing before bed. Love having that, but if I have my tea too close to bed, then I keep myself awake uh, running to the bathroom because I have a bladder the size of a grape. I recently read the book Why We Sleep, which also discussed why the elderly tend to have poor sleep, and one of the reasons was actually that they have weaker bladders, so there is more of a tendency to get up in the middle of the night and have sleep disturbed. So yeah, I try, I'm trying to figure out the like optimal time to have my tea before bed, but right now I basically have it like right after dinner just to make sure there's enough time for everything to get through my system and I'll hopefully be able to sleep more undisturbed. Now, alcohol before bed is the other thing. We all know that alcohol will kind of help you fall asleep or kind of knock you out rather. Anyone who has woken up after a night of too much drinking will know that you still feel exhausted. And that's because of course the alcohol messes with your sleep. 
in Why We Sleep. The, the book discusses how studies have shown that when you have had alcohol, it prevents your brain from entering REM sleep. If you've had a lot of alcohol and you try going to bed really drunk, you basically don't get any REM sleep at all. And that's why you feel super, super exhausted in the morning. It says that even if you've had a little bit of alcohol, that will somewhat impair your brain's ability to enter REM sleep or reduce the overall REM sleep that you get. I'm definitely a have a glass of wine with dinner kind of gal, so it really broke my heart to hear that and that the recommendation was for having your alcohol in the morning. I mean, I'm, I'm all for like a bougie Sunday rosé all day, like, but uh, yeah, so that's something I've been thinking about recently. I will still probably have the occasional glass of wine with dinner, but it's something I've been thinking about. Next, light. Your brain naturally has responses to light and darkness in your environment. Way back when, before humans had artificial light, there was this natural cycle that I, I guess we evolved and adapted to where when the sun would set and night would fall, your brain would have a response. And we have this thing called the pineal gland that releases melatonin in response to your environment becoming dark. With artificial light, that doesn't happen anymore. And evidently in Why We Sleep, evidently the pineal gland is extremely sensitive to even small amounts of light. So I guess like in a no artificial light environment, it waits until the sun's like all the way down and that light, that, that little pink light on the horizon has dimmed most of the way down before releasing melatonin into your body. So when you're sitting in, you know, your living room in the evening with the lights on, or you're sitting in your office at your computer with the lights on, that won't naturally happen until you turn off the lights and you're laying in bed on your phone, as we all do, and you finally have to turn off the lights at like midnight or whatever it is. But after you do that, like most processes in your body, it takes time for your body to realize, hey, the lights are off, time to do my thing. So your body doesn't start releasing its natural melatonin until quite a bit after you actually want to fall asleep. So dimming your environment as much as possible before going to sleep will help kickstart that natural response from your pineal gland to realize, hey, it's nighttime, I should start doing my wind down thing and start telling the body by releasing melatonin that it is sleepy time. And like I said, I'm normally somebody that goes to bed around like 11 p.m. But after I moved into this apartment, actually, I think it was like the second week I was here, there was a power outage and the power went out at like 3 p.m. or something and we didn't get it back till like 3 a.m. or something. So I was sitting there in the evening with a couple candles lit, not a lot of candles lit because I have two very rambunctious cats and cats are like kind of flammable actually. So I only had a couple candles lit in front of me that I could monitor closely. And so I had, I got to experience like when you're out camping, you get to experience that natural, well, besides, besides the little bit of light from the candles, that sort of natural, my environment becoming enclosed in darkness. And by like 8.30 PM, I'd been sitting in darkness for like an hour and I was like, I am ready for bed. We are ready for sleep now, which is crazy. That's so much earlier than I'm used to. Uh, it could have been that I was just also just sleep deprived that day, but it was a very powerful, like I was feeling the melatonin hit kind of feeling. So I think definitely sitting in such a dark environment for that long in the early evening had an impact. So the last big thing for me is by far the most difficult one. And I think this is the most difficult one for a lot of people as well. And I definitely have a number of different strategies I use to try to deal with this. And sometimes it still gets the better of me, but that is reducing anxiety when it's time to go to sleep. One easy, it's not actually always that easy. It takes kind of a lot of effort, but one simple, there's the word, one simple thing that I like to try and do to help reduce my anxiety about sleeping is to give myself lots of time to wind down when I'm going to bed and lots of time to spend time falling asleep because it does take me a long time to fall asleep typically. So if I'm going to bed at 11 and I know I have an early morning that is like less than eight hours away and I'm like, well, if I fall asleep right now, I will have enough sleep that I won't be like totally fucked tomorrow, but I like gotta fall asleep right now. No, I'm gonna be anxious about like gotta fall asleep right now and I'm not gonna be able to fall asleep. Whereas if I'm like, all right, I've got like 45 minutes, I can do a little bit of journaling, a little bit of reading, I can shut off the lights, 
maybe do a bit of meditation or something um, and sit in darkness and let those natural processes kick in in my brain, I'm going to feel a lot more relaxed about falling asleep and that is one way to kind of naturally reduce my anxiety. There are a couple of other strategies that I touched on there and one is journaling. If you've ever had that experience where you're trying to go to bed, you finally close your eyes and all of the things that you have to do suddenly flood your mind, all the things that you're worried about flood your mind and you're going over all these things like, man, I've got so much to do tomorrow, man, why did I say that today? And you just can't shut it off. Journaling. If you are somebody that's experienced this, try writing it down in your journal. An exercise that I like to do is just, I, I think it's called like ramble journaling or something like that. I will write whatever the date is, the top of the page, and just write whatever thoughts are coming into my head, like literally anything. Dinner was nice. I had a slice of pie afterwards. It was delicious. And then just as I start reflecting on my day, all of those things will start to pop in and whatever thoughts pop into my head just goes immediately onto the page. It doesn't have to be coherent. It doesn't have to be pretty, but just let all of those things, all of those reflections about your day, anything that is stressful or worrying, just anything that is popping into your mind, let it flow out onto the page. And then you've kind of had that outlet. And so when you close your eyes to fall asleep, you've, you've already done that. You've already been through all those things that your brain would otherwise go and do had you not journaled. So that, that is something that is extremely helpful for me. Another one that I touched on was reading books. I actually talked about this a whole bunch in another video, but I'm somebody that when I'm falling asleep, I like to, also for the reason of journaling, I like to try to disconnect from my reality as much as possible. So all of those things that are stressful and worrying, maybe if I haven't journaled about it, I'm not thinking about those things. So one way I like to do this is by reading books. Just a nice fantasy book, a nice sci-fi book. Recently I've been reading a nice horror book. That decision is probably somewhat questionable, but it's really interesting and I want to know what happens, so... I haven't had any spooky nightmares yet, but the book hasn't gotten super spooky yet, so... I'll let you know how that one goes. But yeah, reading a book for me really helps. I am lucky enough to have a Kindle with a backlit screen, so I will typically go and read that with all the lights in the room turned off so that I can be exposed to a nice dark nighttime environment and I will turn the dimness on the screen as low as it can go while still being able to comfortably see the words. Usually I will like zoom in a little bit more when I'm reading in the dark, just so it's a little bit easier. And then as my eyes adjust to the darkness as I'm reading, I'm usually able to kind of keep turning the brightness down and still be able to read comfortably. And I know it's there's like a wives tale about reading screens that are backlit in the dark will ruin your vision. I'm like fairly certain that is only a wives tale and I have 2020 vision. I think the last vision test I got was actually better than 2020, which is a thing. Mind you, I probably will end up wearing glasses one day because Everyone in my family has ended up wearing glasses in their older age, and most of those people didn't grow up with backlit screens to each their own. Reading in the dark with my Kindle dimness turned down is a really excellent way for me to wind down, let my body's natural processes kick in, start letting that melatonin flow through my system, and be able to uh, fall asleep when I can't keep my eyes open to read the words anymore. Usually sleep comes very easily at that point. Another super super easy thing that I always do anytime I go to a hotel room, I hate that they do this, but they always have a lit digital clock right next to the bed. Being able to just open my eyes and see what time it is when I, when I know I'm going to have trouble falling asleep because I always do is so stressful. I don't want to be able to like open my eyes and be like, it's been 45 minutes and I've been laying here thinking I'm falling asleep, but not actually falling asleep. I've just been laying here expecting the sleep to come, the sleep is not coming, and it's been 45 minutes, and now that eight hours of sleep I thought I was gonna get is more looking like seven hours of sleep, but if it's gonna take another 45 minutes after this point, then it's gonna be like six hours of sleep, and then... So the anxiety kicks in real bad and it just goes on and on from there. So no visible clocks anywhere in the bedroom, no visible lit clocks, no ticking clocks, hate ticking clocks. So yeah, no visible clocks is a great way to reduce anxiety. <laughs> on that note, I am very sensitive to sound and my partner does snore sometimes at night, so I do actually typically wear earplugs. I, I kind of think of them as like a safety blanket. I can basically just pop them in and despite whatever sounds might be going on in my environment, I know they're not going to bother me, so I'm not going to be anxious about falling asleep before some random sound may that may or may not ever appear. Just 
wakes me up out of my doze because I'm hypersensitive to sounds in my environment. So another thing I've been exploring more recently that has been helpful in my sleeping strategies and adventures is meditation techniques and relaxation techniques. And you can look these up just online anywhere. I think there are a lot of very common ones like just closing your eyes and focusing on your breath is of course a basic meditation technique which I have found to be helpful for becoming present and relaxing. But once doing that, with your eyes closed, just focusing on either some people do the starting at their heads, some people do it starting at their feet, but focusing on the muscles and focusing on having them relax and then slowly traveling down the length of your body or up the length of your body and as you pass every single muscle group focusing on letting them relax and eventually just letting your whole body relax it's a very relaxing thing to do and i have sometimes found that as i'm doing this i end up falling asleep before i can finish the process. I have also found that when I'm in an anxious state and still trying to sleep, if I do this, I'll find that I've been clenching my jaw or there's been tightness in my neck, but especially clenching my jaw, I'm a really bad clencher when I'm anxious or stressed and I didn't even realize I was doing that and that was the thing that was keeping me awake because I had muscles engaged and you can't sleep when you're just like this. So. Really, really helpful on that. And there are, of course, there are lots of apps and things like Calm that are aimed at just teaching you this. But if you don't have the money for Calm or you're really cheap like I am, there are a lot of free resources online for strategies that you can use for relaxation. So one of the other things that will really reduce my anxiety, but I have not been able to employ yet, it is my goal, it is my next strategy, but I'm not quite there yet, and that is having no alarm clock. So here's the thing, if you are getting adequate sleep and you are on a consistent sleep schedule, you should always be able to wake up without an alarm clock consistently. And that that is one thing that I do become anxious about when I'm trying to fall asleep and I'm struggling to fall asleep. It's like, uh, I know my alarm clock is going to be going off at this time. It's going to wake me up and my sleep is not going to be adequate and I'm going to feel like shit for the whole day. And I hate feeling tired and shit the whole day from not sleeping because my brain is anxious and annoying and I can't control it. On the weekends, I if I can avoid it, I will never have an alarm clock so that I can just embrace the full relaxation and the full like freedom of knowing regardless of how well or not well my sleep goes i will be able to just sleep for as much as my body needs not having an alarm clock is a great way for me to reduce my stress and that i'm hoping to be able to do eventually what i did mention very briefly there is being on a consistent sleep schedule which in why we sleep is I think one of the top three tips that he gives uh, towards the end of the book for being able to get good sleep, and that is having the same sleep schedule every day and not changing on weekends. This is really difficult. This is something that I work on, but I, I struggle with. I always want to like stay up a little bit of extra on weekends to play video games with friends or watch movie, and it's hard, <laughs> especially at the end of the day when you've used a lot of your discipline, stamina, to you know, actually maintain the self-discipline to go to bed. I think this is also partially exacerbated by the fact that I am a night owl and I think I would naturally go to bed at like closer to midnight or 1am and wake up more at like 9 or 10. But just because of how I want to structure my day and especially with respect to daylight, I want to be able to get a little bit of an earlier start to my day. So I do try to go to bed a little bit earlier than perhaps I naturally would as a night owl. And I think this is something that is especially hard for all night owls, seeing as how I mentioned right at the beginning, we do live in a society that is meant for early birds, whatever they're called, and not for night owls. It's really difficult to maintain that discipline to go to bed at an early person time when that's just not natural for your body and your genetics. So inevitably, when I do mess up my sleep schedule, one thing that I do is I use melatonin to encourage my body to reset my sleep schedule essentially and re reset my, my mind and my body's bedtime to the time that I want it to be. So if I went out and hung out with people until 1am and it was way past my bedtime, um, or I've ended up doing that multiple times in a row like I did 
last week. There's no way in hell my brain is going to be able to fall asleep at 11 at that point. They say that you should take it about an hour before bed, so I will usually go and take it an hour before I'm going to start winding down, that is journaling or reading a book or whatever. Um, so it might be like more like 90 to 120 minutes before I'm actually falling asleep. And that, that works really great for me. If you do take melatonin, a lot of times the pills that you get from stores are in like really high dosages, like five or 10 milligrams. A lot of times you don't need that much to actually feel the effects of it, but again, it depends on who you are, your body, your physiology. So I, I have five milligram pills and I know for me personally, that is way too much and I'm gonna wake up in the morning super groggy because my body's not gonna be able to get rid of all that melatonin, <laughs> that extra melatonin that I inject into it. So usually I will break it into smaller pieces and have somewhere between one and two milligrams. And then I have these other little gel pills that are 1.5 milligrams of melatonin each. And for my body, that is usually the perfect amount. If I'm like really jet lagged or way off my sleep schedule, I might take a little bit more than that, like three milligrams. Usually not five unless I'm having a really bad time, I guess. But usually that will cause more unintended effects the next morning of me just being kind of groggy and drowsy. But that melatonin also really helps with my anxiety where I will be thinking about going to bed or trying to go to bed knowing that like my sleep schedule is really messed up and I'm tired but I might not be able to sleep because my body clock is so messed up it might just not let me but by injecting this little extra melatonin maybe if even I've taken too little to have much of an effect I at least get a placebo effect knowing that like I can relax and trust in the melatonin and that just helps my anxiety just so if you're interested to learn more about why you should strive for that full night of natural sleep, which you should, like you really, really should, I definitely would recommend reading this book, Why We Sleep. I got it from my local library. I got it as an audiobook and I listened to it in the morning as I was making tea or as I was folding my laundry or washing dishes or doing whatever. It talks about everything you could want to know about sleep. It might be a little bit better as a physical book because there are graphs. If you like reading graphs and looking at data, uh, which I do, I felt like I was missing out on that because in the audiobook, they just describe what it looks like. And you know, that's, that is what it is. Uh, it's fine, you still get the point. It's it's just insane how much of an impact that it has on our bodies for how little it's valued in our society. Not having enough sleep in early childhood or in your teenage years is linked to all sorts of mental diseases. It, it doesn't only have an impact on mental diseases, but also physical ones as well. Being very sleep deprived for many, many years of your life will put you at risk for a number of diseases, both mental and physical, and reduces actually your ex expected lifespan by a number of years, statistically speaking, which is insane. One thing that I learned from this book that I, I definitely carry with me, that I, I think about anytime I, I know I am not going to be able to get enough sleep. When we're awake during the day and we're using our brains, we're essentially, it's it's being damaged. Like the longer we're awake, the more damaged it becomes. And that's why people who are really sleep deprived have all these crazy effects, how they become as impaired as somebody who's drunk, why they eventually start hallucinating and seeing things is your brain is just becoming more and more and more damaged and their brains can't heal. As I mentioned earlier with alcohol and sleep, and this is something the book talks about as well, REM sleep is really critical for that healing, but the couple hours of light sleep that you get after your body is finished with REM sleep is so critical to the healing of your brain for storing memories for doing all the good work that sleep does those last few hours are extremely critical so if you're getting six hours instead of eight hours of sleep it's not that you're getting 75 percent of the sleep that you would have been getting you're getting less than that you're getting like a lot less than that in terms of the value of the sleep and the amount of repairing that has been able to occur in your brain so that's something that i think about when I don't get to sleep is all of that good good brain repairing and storing of memories and learning especially if you're a student this is really important and i wish i knew this as a student there's one crazy study also that i wish i knew when i was in music school so they did a study and they were playing music to participants as they were sleeping and then you know they would test them on their ability to remember certain songs so they had some participants listen when they're awake and then they would have them go to sleep and then they had other participants listen when they're awake and then they continued playing the music as those participants slept. The the ones that heard the music as they're sleeping remembered it way better than the ones that only listened when they were awake. 
This would have been so helpful for all the listening exams that I had to take for all my music history classes. Oh my god, if only I had known that I could have improved how I did on the exam by sleeping listening to music. At the end of the day, I think it's, it's just so interesting and important to understand the impact that sleep has on your brain because our minds are who we are. It's the most precious thing that you have. We as a society should value taking care of it above all things. I, and I know so many people who, I, I feel like it's most people in our society is like, yeah, you know, getting six or seven hours, it doesn't feel good. I'll like sleep it back over the weekend. That doesn't work, by the way. If you if you read this book, that th that's not a thing. What you lose by not sleeping can't be slept back. That's just with you. That definitely hurts me as somebody that has spent a lot of their life really sleep deprived. Really explains a lot of my problems. In any case, point I'm trying to make is this this whole like hustle lots, sleep little, and then you'll be a wonderful, successful contributor to society and all of its great values is like complete BS and we should all take care of ourselves and acknowledge, first of all, physically how our bodies and our minds work to the extent that we know right now. Just value knowing how to take care of yourself because it's like deceptively complicated and hard sometimes. <laughs> what do we have if not our minds? is what I'm saying. I don't know if, it, if it's my current sleep deprivation talking or, or what, but we went through a lot there. I'm gonna wrap it up there. Um, I would love to know what you think of this, and I would really love to know if you learned anything or if you're interested in checking out the book. I always love seeing comments from you. Leave a comment down below if you have any thoughts or opinions, positive or negative. I would just love to talk about this with you guys if you are watching this video. And if you made it to the end, thank you so much. It means the world, so. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in, and I'll see you guys next time. Let's get this show on the road. What have you been- you-